Good evening, everybody, and welcome to what is tonight our 75th webinar. Tonight, we're joined by June, who is returning as a guest to lead the session tonight on um, intersectionality and anti-racism in social work. So um, last time that June joined us was our anti-racism widening the debate webinar. You'll know if you're a regular attender, we've done a series of webinars looking at anti-racism since I think anti-racist practice was our very first panel webinar. It was the first time we invited a number of guests along. And that was, um, I think actually that still remains the one that had the most attendance. Um, but we've had a lot of different webinars on anti-racism. And last time June joined us, she just spoke for about 15 minutes. And at that point, June was actually a social work student. June is no longer a social work student. She's actually just about to move into a new role. I think you start Monday, June, do you? And she'll be the commissioning editor for diversity and social justice at Sage Publishing. So that's um, um, June's new job as of Monday. But because June was so incredibly popular as a guest last time, then we invited her to come along and lead a whole webinar for us. June is going to continue to talk to us tonight about intersectionality and explore anti-racism within social work. So I'm going to stop talking now because we've got a good number in the room. I'm going to sit back with my notepad, make lots of notes for my own CPD and learn a great deal tonight, I am sure, from June. So June, I'm just going to hand straight over to you if that's okay. And time starting the webinar now good evening everybody and welcome to what is tonight our 75th webinar tonight we're joined by june who is returning as a guest to lead the session tonight on um, intersectionality and anti-racism in social work if you're here for the first time, then do please take a look around. You should have a bar in front of you that has the option for chat. We like to get everybody used to using the chat when you come in. So we normally ask a question. Tonight, I thought I might share with you my Sunday experience, which is still with me today. So on Sunday, I had a day of extremes. I was um, both incredibly proud of myself and then incredibly disappointed in myself. I've joined a hiking group. I went for a 15 mile hike. I nearly dragged myself at the end of it, but I walked 15 miles and thought, this is brilliant. And then I realized when I got home that I put that my phone on the top of my car when getting back into the, into the car and I'd driven off. And my phone is probably smashed in lots of pieces all over the place. So on the one hand, I was incredibly proud of myself for this walk. And then on the other hand, incredibly disappointed with myself and cross with myself about what I'd done with my phone. That has had a hangover effect. Both things have had a hangover effect in that I am still, my legs are aching like anything still. And I've still not got a telephone and I feel completely and utterly cut off without all of my usual communication skills. So tell us in the chat, when have you had some uh, kind of felt very, very proud of yourself or very disappointed in yourself? Or when have you had a story like that? So tell us something about yourself in the chat. Tell us where you are. Tell us if you're a social work student tell us so thank you people are starting to tell us laura's telling us she's a step up student in the northeast brilliant tell us if you're a social worker tell us if you're a student tell us if you're a practice educator make sure that your chat is set to uh everybody so that everybody can see what you're saying it should be set to everyone and then you'll be able to see everybody and um, we can see some returning people uh like helen and warren uh, thank you very much Kultuma, you lost your wedding ring. It's terrible, isn't it? When you lose something, you just kind of feel bereft without it, don't you? So um, we're getting lots of people now telling us about themselves in the chat. Chat's moving really quickly. That's great because what we're going to do tonight is we're going to ask you if you've got any questions or any comments, anything that you would like to share with June, we're going to ask you to put those into the chat. 
Um, and then um, hopefully June will be able to um, share her thoughts with us. We've gone international, I've seen now, we've got students joining us from South Africa. Um, we've got uh, someone here from Ontario, Canada. Um, so we've got a global audience with us tonight. Um, ready to hear from June. So I think we're, we're over 120 people in the room now. Um, another student there from South Africa joining us. So lots of people. Oh, there we go. Somebody has is very proud of themselves getting on the social work course. That's amazing. Well done to you. Uh, it's gone really quick, so I'm not catching up and keeping up with everything, but well done to the person that shared that with us. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to you now, to June. Now, June joined us. Heidi's asking, is this one going to be... Um, um, on YouTube, yes, it will. It's next week that we're not going to have, um, we're not going to be YouTubing. So um, last time that June joined us was our anti-racism widening the debate webinar. You'll know if you're a regular attender, we've done a series of webinars looking at anti-racism since I think anti-racist practice was our very first panel webinar. It was the first time we invited a number of guests along. And that was, um, I think actually that still remains the one that had the most attendance. Um, but we've had a lot of different webinars on anti-racism. And last time June joined us, she just spoke for about 15 minutes. And at that point, June was actually a social work student. June is no longer a social work student. She's actually just about to move into a new role. I think you start Monday, June, do you? And she'll be the commissioning editor for diversity and social justice at Sage Publishing. So that's... Um, um, June's new job as of Monday but because June was so incredibly popular as a guest last time then we invited her to come along and lead a whole webinar for us. June is going to continue to talk to us tonight about intersectionality and explore anti-racism within social work. So I'm going to stop talking now because we've got a good number in the room. I'm going to sit back with my notepad, make lots of notes for my own CPD and learn a great deal tonight, I am sure, from June. So June, I'm just going to hand straight over to you if that's okay. Yeah, we do this, right? Start talking and we're on mute. Hi, everyone. Um, it is definitely great to be back. Um, so um, not in social work very more, but social work has my heart. I have, you know, at least two friends, if not more, that are social workers. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something I think about quite a lot. So I'm hoping that we can kind of this night kind of walk, walk our way through thinking about intersectionality and anti-racism and how we can have a, a more radical approach to social work practice. So I'm going to start my timer because I am a talker and I want to make sure that we get some time for questions at the end. So just to begin, I think it would be great to kind of jump in and just kind of talk a little bit about what intersectionality is, because I recognize that it's a popular term, um, but it is not necessarily one that everyone knows. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why intersectionality is, is important and how it relates to social work um, and social work practice, because I think, you know, when you think about intersectionality, you might not necessarily think about frontline social workers or, you know, micro, macro level social work, my, uh, micro level social work and all the different ways that um, we social work, right? So intersectionality is a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. So Kimberly Crenshaw is a legal scholar in the US and it's intentionally when she was thinking about intersectionality, she was kind of dealing with this conundrum where, um, you know, it was thinking about specifically about Black women. Now, intersectionality has expanded much beyond that, but it was thinking about how you know, when Black women were experiencing racism or, you know, experiencing any kind of discrimination, it was not just tied to the fact that they were Black, so not just tied to their race, but also tied to their gender, right? And, but under the way the law functions, there was no space for that. So men were Black, women were white, and there was no space in, in between. So intersectionality was a way for us to make legible the experiences of Black women and the ways in which anti-Blackness and misogyny are combined to discriminate and further oppress Black women. Now, um, if we think about today, when we think about intersectionality, intersectionality 
is really a feminist principle, a feminist practice. And it asks us to consider how different intersecting identities, so maybe gender, race, uh, sexuality, class, can intersect to affect the ways in which people move in the world, right? And the ways in which that they have access to power. Um, and so thinking about social work and thinking about, well, how, how does intersectionality apply, apply to social work? Well, first of all, when we think as, as social workers, who, who you're working with, right? So you're often working with communities, individuals, and families who are more likely to be vulnerable and marginalized, right? So, you know, that might be issues around poverty, discrimination, disability, sexuality, or more. Um, so social workers, you are inherently working with these populations and having an interest, uh, an understanding of intersectionality can really kind of radicalize the way in which you work, right? So if you're working with a child who is, um, let's say you're working with a child who's having, you know, issues at school, right? And you're having this kind of narrative that's placed that they're a difficult child and they have behavioral issues. Intersectionality, if you apply that to that process, you could go to the child's home or where they live in their environment and really kind of look at the factors that are impacting them, right? So that child might be dealing with poverty. They might be living in um, environments where there are high amounts of racism or discrimination. Um, they might have family members who have dealt with intergenerational trauma. And having that approach and understanding that, or they might even have disabilities that are not recognized because of their race, right? Or because of their gender. You know, there's lots and lots of research that's showing that women are more likely to be, um, or, you know, female presenting people are, find it harder to get diagnoses for things like ADHD um, because of the way it presents. So always having that understanding of gender, class, culture, and understanding how that impacts your clients is really important. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a background of how you could apply intersectionality in your kind of day-to-day -day work. So when you're going into an environment, you're not just thinking about what's in front of you um, and the like, you know, the one issue you might be, be, be working with or seeing, but you're thinking about how people are multiply marginalized, which is a new term, which is thinking about the multiple ways that they might be dealing with the effects of oppression and discrimination in the world, right? But again, I think, when we think about social work practice and social work educators and social work curriculum, I don't think a lot is done to really make sure um, social workers are anti-racist and intersectional, intersectional in their approach, right? And we know this because there are some really interesting studies that show that um, students from BAME backgrounds um, are more likely when they go on to have their ASYE placements, they're more likely to be reprimanded or, you know, face issues at work. There is discrimination in terms of representation of social work practitioners at lecture at universities, right? Think about how many social workers who talk about intersectionality or who talk about anti-racism are actually white and don't have that um, experience or background from the communities that they're working in, right? Think about the fact that so many of your peers are from Black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds, but they're not getting that reflection in the work that they're doing. And I think also when we think about anti-racism, it's really complicating how we approach social work practice and how we approach social work education, right? So when I was a student at Brunel, um, and I was in a class um, about kind of, um, social work and we were talking about when would be a time to introduce a social worker um, and a student said well a time where we might introduce a social worker is if a child goes to school and they don't have nice school uniform um, and so, um, you know, they don't have the, you know, they don't have clean school uniform or maybe their school uniform is old from the year behind and their, you know, their socks are dirty and they just kind of look a little bit unkempt, right? And the practitioner, uh, the lecturer said, yes, that's a great example. And I remember sitting in the auditorium thinking, hmm, that's interesting, right? It's interesting that when we social work, a child experiencing maybe neglect, but maybe just poverty, right, is now a tool for intervention, right? So a child who is 
maybe has there, you know, there are lots and lots of factors that might affect your child not having quote unquote good uniform for school, right? It might be due to issues around poverty. It might be that their parent is disabled and is unable to take care of them. It might be that the child is a young carer themselves. It might be that a child has, you know, sensory issues, other disabilities. There's so much that could be going on. But I thought it was so interesting that social work, um, often the work that we're doing is powerful and is needed, but sometimes there is kind of hurt that we're doing and harm that we're causing to communities, right? So I've always been of the, the view that if we think about power, power and oppression, and we think about poverty, right? Why do we think, this is an interesting question that I had a, a friend who was a social worker in the US say to me, why do we think that poverty is enough to kind of remove a child from a home? And then why do we think it is acceptable to remove a child from a home because of poverty, place them in a home that they don't recognize, right? So a foster home with a, a different family that they're not connected to, and then provide that family with financial resources to take care of that child while their biological family misses out, right? And there are, I will say, there are, there are instances in which children need to be removed. But as someone who speaks to, who um, regularly follows foster care as foster moms, people who are engaging in the foster care system, I do believe that there are incidents where more can be done, right? So another really great question that I like to ask is when we think about kinship care, so kinship care being a child maybe being removed from their family, but then placed with a family member or someone else who can take care of them. If we think about kinship care and the lack of support that is actually offered to families families who want to participate in that. So a really great example of this was I was listening to a series about Native American children who are often in the U.S. Um, removed from their birth families and placed with white families. And then their, you know, family members who wanted to take care of them but didn't have the financial means often wouldn't qualify for the government subsidies and support that we often offer to foster parents. So when you think about radicalizing social work, we can think about poverty and race we can recognize that children from Black and Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds are more likely to live in poverty, right? We know that. We know that, um, you know, Black families in the, in the UK, I was listening to some research the other day that showed that, you know, in the next 20 to 30 years in the US, they think the net wealth, the net wealth for Black families is going to be zero dollars, right? That is something that is in the US, that's something that happens in the UK as well. Um, I think in the UK, we like to push the thing that like, we're not America, so we're not racist. Um, but if we consider how poverty and race um, intersect to create environments where children might be unsafe or might experience neglect, and then we look at our systems, it makes sense, right? Because we know that children from BAME backgrounds are overrepresented in foster care. We know they're overrepresented in that system. And so a radical intersectional and anti-racist approach to social work is thinking about what can we do as social workers working with these this, within these systems to mitigate that those risks, right? So that children are not leaving loving family homes because their parents are experiencing racial di discrimination. That means that they are less likely to get um, higher levels of pay more likely to, you know, less likely to go to university and get the support that they need, more likely to need to have debt, not being able to afford emergency expenses, right? Those are not necessarily reasons why children should be removed from their homes. So I've always said when I was going to be a social worker, and I'm not a social worker anymore, but I've always said that the goal of social work should be not to exist, right? If social work, and I know a lot of y'all want your jobs, and I get it, but the very fact that we have social work as a profession, as an industry, points to us that our social systems are broken, right? Because if we had social systems that supported families, if we had social systems that put in place support for families to stay together, if we didn't penalize around poverty and other forms of discrimination, then there wouldn't be a need for social work. There, there might be cases where children experience, you know, extreme abuse where that is necessary. But what we would see is that the vast majority of children would not need state intervention, right? And we know that state intervention isn't always helpful. There's trauma that comes with that. There are failed placements that children have to endure, especially children who might be disabled, children who might come from BAME backgrounds. There are, you know, very interesting conversations around how children from BAME backgrounds, you know, don't have 
um, representation in their foster cares and their doctors, more of them are on the list to be adopted. Or even if we think, apologies, let me just turn this off. Or even if we think in the US, right, we know that black babies cost less money to adopt, right? So what does that say about the value that we place on, ch um, on children and families and adults in our society who don't come from privilege? Um, I think next slide. So these are just some different high level themes that come um, when we talk about um, intersectionality. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, moving from disability rights frameworks to disability justice. So when we've kind of first had, you know, the ADA in the US or the Equality Act in the UK, thinking about disability, it was mostly around disability rights, right? So mostly about, you know, making sure that disabled people are able to, you know, contribute to society. So there are lots of different schemes. I'm disabled, so I'm aware of lots of them. There's personal independence payment. You know, there's access to work. But even then, it's not enough, right? And I've often thought it interesting, the hoops, the hoops that governments will make people who are disabled jump just to get adequate care and support. And that is across the board. That's not just people who are disabled, that's people who are poor, that's people who are refugees, that's people who are marginalized in some way, right? There are hoops. And oftentimes the amount of money that we're offering communities is not enough to survive. Could you, as my friend um, who is disabled, um, and has a number of different issues, survive, has to survive on 300 pounds a month. Could you survive on 300 pounds a month? I know that I could not survive on 300 pounds a month. It's, it's actually feasibly impossible, right? And there are other benefits she has, but that's money for transportation, that's money for medication, that's money for, you know, groceries, food, bills. It's just not sufficient, right? So when we think about disability justice, what that does, with intersectionality and how this applies to social work. So it's asking us, why do we live in a world where the ability to not exist in poverty and not, you know, suffer is tied to your ability to work? Why is that, right? Capitalism, obviously, but why is that the system and how does that function and how does that then affect people who are marginalized? And when you're social workers, it's um, advocating and doing not just a micro level work. So the work you do every day with children and families and adults who are, you know, and individuals who need that help, but also advocating for better legislational changes, policy changes that will have direct impact on the people that you're serving, right? Disability justice and intersectionality causes us to really move away from this idea of independence, that everybody needs to be independent and actually recognize that there is a need for interdependence, right? That in order for us to survive in a society, it's expected that we need to rely on other people, right? And so having that approach to thinking about working with people with disabilities allows us to not just constantly think, how can we move this person into an employment? How can we do this? How can we do that? But maybe just thinking about how can we improve their quality of life? What policies can we think about? What can we advocate for with our managers, right? What um, attitudes and myths can we be thinking about dispelling? How do we even talk about people with disabilities, right? In our society, what are the conversations you're having when you're working with other social workers, you know, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech therapists, all of them, how do they talk about your disabled clients? And what is the work that you can do to actually challenge it in those rooms, right? So instead of working with children who might be, you know, Black or a minority ethnic who are displaying, quote unquote, behavioral difficulties, applying, or, you know, applying intersectionality and anti-racism might cause you to have a little bit more empathy for the people you're working with and think, instead of seeing them as problematic and things that we need to solve and problems that we need to solve, it's recognizing that, okay, maybe this child has had 13, 14 care placements. They've experienced a deep amount of trauma. They don't have family bonds. How might that affect their behavior? And there is work being done, right? In social work, you do learn that, but I think more of that and, and, and recognizing that even challenging when another practitioner or another person just tries to dismiss them or talk about your client, even doing the work within that space to say, hey, um, let's not talk about people like that. Let's change the way we think about disability is really, really important, right? 
I often think as someone who's visually impaired that I hate the narrative people say to me like, oh, we would never know you're disabled. Like, you're just so amazing. You're so, you're, you know, I had a, a guy from the council yesterday or Monday come in to teach me how to use a cane, right? Like a long cane. Um, and he just kept saying to me, well, you're really intelligent. You're a lot smarter than a lot of my other clients with disabilities. So I know you're just going to catch on this really quickly. And I have to say to him, is this how you think about the people you work with? You think they're dumb and stupid? And now you're telling me that I'm quote unquote more intelligent than the, you know, the disabled clients you work with, right? That's a rehabilitation worker, right? And so having to be in my own home and challenge how he thinks about that, um, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, but as social workers, that's the work you should be doing, right? And that's how thinking about structures, really that's what intersectionality is getting us to do, is thinking about structures, is thinking about power. In any space you're in, thinking about who here has power and who does not have power, and how can we create a more equal balance, right? Um, moving on to Afro-pessimism and anti-Black violence, I think that that's a big one for the UK. Um, if you're familiar with Afro-pessimism, if you're a nerd like me and you read lots and lots of different um, academia and articles, Afro-pessimism is really kind of saying that the legacies of institutional racism, slavery, colonization, settler colonialism, you know, indigeneity, all of that is going to be really, really hard to overcome. And until we recognize those systems and recognize how they impact the way in which Black people and people who are marginalized move through the world, right? So again, when you're a social worker, when you're thinking about race and racism, it's really calling you to understand that the microaggressions and the racism that you see on a day-to-day -day basis is a systemic problem, right? It is not an individual issue, it is a systemic issue. And systemic issues need systemic approaches, but systemic approaches also need advocates and people who are educated and understand these issues so they can push for change that is going to really impact people on that micro level, right? So working in communities that have been ravaged by knife crime, ravaged by poverty, ravaged by gun crime, um, drug, all of that, it's, it's recognizing the ways in which um, the criminal justice system functions and how that harms Black communities. It's thinking about um, the lack of opportunity that can happen in those neighborhoods, the ways in which students are kind of pushed into those difficult situations. And again, it's all about improving and changing the way in which you approach those issues, right? Um, what is on the side? Sorry. Racism and climate justice. Okay. Um, so then moving kind of like to sexual violence, a lot of you will be working with, you know, individuals and children and families who have dealt with trauma. I've just picked sexual violence as one of the types of trauma, but um, intersectionality, when we think about how intersectionality applies to things like sexual violence, it's moving beyond Me Too, which is very important, right? So white celebrities and how they experience, you know, sexual assault and sexual violence in the film industry, but thinking about how that is on a day on a day to day level, right? So when you think about child sexual exploitation, it's um, having radical approaches to how you're doing treatment and support, but also understanding how children are essentially groomed, right? And how that um, that system kind of like multiplies and how that works. Um, it's necessarily not always thinking that a child or an adult or a person or even a perpetrator. Right? Let's talk about perpetrators of violence, because we don't like to talk about perpetrators of violence. But if we're going to live in a society where we don't have people who are you know, perpetuating sexual violence, sexual assault, we have to really understand how, how they come into the equation, right? Mm -hmm. So something I always like to say is that, you know, the way our current system functions is you know, quote unquote, like if we think about mainstream feminism and how they would see things, right? And I'm going to tell you what intersectionality is different. So mainstream feminism might say, okay, lots and lots of women and non-binary people go through the criminal justice system to deal with sexual violence and sexual assault. Very, 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 as we know, very, very, very few cases actually make it to where there is some level of prosecution and that person is sent to jail. Right. So when we see what happens with Bill Cosby and listen, that man got to go to jail. That this is where my radical approaches and my emotions will collide. And I'll say, I want to throw you 
under the jail, literally. But then I have to be like, how is that helping, right? So when we think about sexual violence and perpetrators of violence, um, so that might be considered a, like a feminist victory, right? A person who's, you know, um, a person who's committed sexual violence being sent to jail for the rest of their lives and we all clap our hands and say justice has been served. And that's okay, right? I understand that it's complicated to think about sexual violence and criminal justice and all of that and the intersections there. But what intersectionality might bring to that and to the table um, is that it might say, is locking people up necessarily going to end sexual violence, right? Is removing these people from society going to end sexual violence, going to end domestic violence, going to end any kind of interpersonal violence? No, it's actually not because you put them away for five years and they stay in jail and they're, they're treated badly and they, you know, there is not that much work on rehabilitation and they come out and they probably perpetuate violence again. And we know this because recidivism rates are high. So we know the people who often engage in crime and violence will come out and do the exact same thing, right? So intersectionality will say, how about we build a world where we don't see criminalization or prison as a means of succeeding and dealing with domestic sexual abuse and other kinds of interpersonal traumas and violence, right? Um, intersectionality and you will, will push us to think about how um, people who grew up in homes experiencing violence and, you know, intergenerational trauma and how that can push people to be abusive. Intersectionality will push us to think about approaches that will actually eradicate, eradicate the source of violence, not just cover it up and put it away where we don't have to see it and we don't have to deal with it. I've always thought it was interesting when I was with my mom in New York and we were walking uh, in Brooklyn and I saw a prison. I was like, what is a prison doing in New York City, right? And then I had to like catch myself back and think that's what our society does. Just throw them away, put them away where we can't see them. And we don't have to think about the issues beyond just this kind of surface, surface level analysis, right? And that's probably what we also see when people talk about abolishing the police. How can we think of a police force like the Met who are literally engaging all kinds of sexual violence. And we know in the US that there are cover-ups of, you know, I mean, I was listening to a news story about a cop who literally was engaging in um, um, child sexual exploitation and he did not lose his job, right? So these police officers, these are the people, I say these are the people who are meant to uphold the law and they can't even uphold the law themselves. And what, what exactly does that, do, does that do? Because crime and violence and all that still continues and perpetuates. And the solution, as everybody knows, is not more police. The solution is thinking and changing our criminal justice system of new approaches about how we think about justice, how we think about rehabilitation, how we think about community, um, community accountability, right? If we look at indigenous tribes and the ways in which that they deal with um, wrongdoings and harm, it's a community effort, right? So how is it that we can all be engaged citizens so we don't have to deal with these issues, right? Um, I was gonna say something and my mind just blanked. So it was, it was gonna be a good point as well, but we'll, we'll keep it moving. Um, so yeah, so when we think about that, it's, you know, that's another way that, um, oh, I do know what I was going to say. So when, when you're a social worker and you're dealing with child expo sexual exploitation, I think there could be really radical work that social workers could be doing around engaging with perpetrators of violence, understanding why that violence happens, what causes that violence, and the different remedies and therapies and support that we can be engaging in to actually eradicate those issues. Is it a next slide? I think... Okay, no, it's not the next slide. Um, I mean, whatever, which is some amazing people. Um, and I was going to talk a little bit about climate justice um, as well. Um, and I think um, when we think about climate issues or climate justice, a lot of it is recycling and composting and all that is great. I need to up my recycling game. It's, it's really not where it's meant to be. But when we think about intersectionality um, and how this might, you know, impact the work that you're doing and how you think about these issues, um, questions. I don't know if anyone's followed Quadro, um, who is on social housing on, you know, Quadro Housing on Twitter. If you're a social worker, you should be following that account, okay? Because the housing situations that people who are marginalized are living in is actually like. I'm, I'm not going to swear because Siobhan, you know, she done told me don't do that, but it is absolutely terrible, like terrible, I would say, 
it's effed, but it's terrible, right? And so climate justice is thinking about Grenfell, right? And thinking about why that happened, right? It's thinking about why is it that um, people who are more marginalized and more likely to live in communities where they are prone to more illnesses like asthma, um, they're more likely to be, you know, with the higher levels of pollution. We know that, um, in, you know, in indigenous, um, in the U.S. and America, feeling about the Dakota Access Pipeline and the fact that, you know, that actually, that pipeline means that like children from indigenous communities, families, adults, everyone do not have access to clean water. And then think about council housing. Girl, we have to do better because I don't even know what to say about that. But the mold, the disrepair, the lack of support for those tenants and just seeing them as like, you know, like people who don't deserve safe spaces. How can we, how can you parent in a way that is loving and kind? How can you raise children um, and create safe environments for your children when they are literally living with cockroach infestations, mice infestations, a mold all over the walls? How, you know, and then we go in and we remove these children and we say, oh, it's neglect, right? But then we're not looking at the systemic issues that are kind of beneath that, right? That it might be really hard for a mother to parent her child if she's living as one of them, one of the mothers said that, you know, she is suicidal because of the her housing situation, because the mold was literally 4D and cockroaches were literally running on the floor and her child, you know, one of them climbed into her ear at night. And, you know, she, there was a video that she posted of her child breathing and it was just heartbreaking. If families are living those kind of conditions, how on earth can we expect them to, you know, engage in responsive and gentle and kind and affirmative parenting when they are literally clinging on for survival, right? So when we think about that and then thinking about um, how that means that, you know, families living in that type of housing are likely to suffer with like wind, uh, not wind, sorry, um, like climate emergencies, right? So looking at storms and that housing is more likely to be, um, you know, not as secure and then there's less support. So it's just like, it's a systemic issue that just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. But having safe homes, safe environments, safe, clean, dignified, I think that's the word I was missing, dignified homes for the families that we're working in is key. Right. And we cannot, you know, and we and what we do is we punish parents, we punish, you know, for living in those circumstances and not being able to, quote unquote, be active members of society or parent in a way that we would want to see them with parenting because we're not considering the whole environment. So when you think about intersectionality and anti-racism, you're going into an environment and into a space and you're considering the whole environment. Right. And you're thinking again, about how might this affect how this person has access to power. Do you think that you would be able to engage in full-time work if you're, you know, you're working from home and there's mold on the walls? How does that affect a child's social skills? They can't bring friends home. There's so much that happens, right? And then those children then experience other forms of neglect, but then we don't really think about the fact that um, there are systemic issues at play. Um, that, you know, that we have to be thinking about and considering. So I'm, I'm aware that I only have 10 more minutes before I have to round up. So um, I think one of the things that you can be doing as social workers, as social work educators, practitioners, um, all of that is making sure that you're engaging and thinking about diverse voices and that you're, you know, engaging in the scholarship that is happening so that it's always front of mind and that your approaches are more and more radical. So I've put some people here um, that I love. Alice Wong is, you know, a disability activist. Um, she has a really great book called, um, and I don't remember what it's called, but is disability something you can find on Amazon. I contributed an essay to it. Um, so she's great. Um, you know, there's Autumn who does some really interesting work in Canada around uh, climate activism. 
Alec, who's basically, you know, gender non-performing performance artist, and then Jennifer Nash, who is my professor at Duke University, who does some really interesting work around race uh, and racism. Um, and also, and so she also has a book called uh, Around Intersectionality, if anyone's interested, and um, the work that she's doing is pushing intersectionality forward. Um, so she's also a great person to be connecting with. Um, and I think that's also um, important for the work you're doing is making sure that the um, resources and the things that you're learning from are coming from those diverse voices, those more radical voices um, and, and, and engaging with that. I think, um, again, some of the work that you could be doing as students, as educators, is having those conversations with your lecturers, having those conversations with your practice tutors. I know they, I know when you guys have like a whole list of people, practice tutors, practice educator tutors, like there is so much, but you know, going to them and saying that we want to have more radical approaches to how we think about social issues, right? We don't just want what's tried and tested and what everyone is doing because we want to, or at least I want to live in a world where we don't have an, a need for social work. Like, like I said, there will be instances where there is extreme abuse where children need to be removed, but on a day-to-day -day functioning, like we don't need to have that because we have a society where there's accountability, there's trust, there's support, there is resilience, there is um, there are systems and we've broken apart those systemic issues. And I really think um, Kim um, Young, who is a social worker, um, has, you know, who I, if you're looking for um, social workers to follow, she's dope black social worker on Instagram. And I love how she says that before I'm a social worker, I'm, I'm a radical, right? Because social work is a radical profession. Like it really is like to think about a profession where the work we're doing is to mitigate and um, reduce um, systemic inequalities and to create safer environments for individuals, uh, children, and families. That is inherently radical work, right? That is powerful work to, to see that, but it's not enough, right? And I think the way in which we approach things and we think about things, we can always be expanding our approaches, expanding the way we work. Um, and I think in the UK, we can also recognize the massive barriers that exist um, within social work. Um, we can recognize how, you know, social work education itself and degrees are not primed for people who are low income, right? The expectation that you go to a council and you work there for what, what are your placements, 70 days, 100 days um, for no pay, and you get, you know, a small bursary amount, and that's supposed to get you through. Think about the people that leaves out of social work and think about the contributions that they are making. So as students, it's pushing for better support within your degree program, right? I'm not saying you have to be paid this, you know, the same rate as a social worker, but there should be adequate compensation that means that people who want to engage in social work, especially people with lived experiences, people with lived experiences of the criminal justice system, people with lived experiences of, you know, family courts and social work, um, intervention are able to come into the field because having that lived experience you know changes the way we approach things and it's and it's it's powerful right having that experience and and how it in you know it brings further insight so that we don't because honestly I'm not gonna lie to you like social work a lot of the time looks like a bunch of white middle class women who you know pat themselves on the back for helping a black child in need like it can't, you know, some people might say that's derogatory, but a lot of it is about, you know, a lot of social work students I've engaged with don't want to think about their, and you know, their own racist um, beliefs. They don't want to think themselves that they have any kind of racism at all. But as we know from the pandemic, you know, we saw reports that said Black social workers um, were going into homes without PPE while their white co-workers were hoarding PPE and keeping it for themselves and laughing at their black social worker, you know, their, their black colleagues. You want to tell me that that's anti-racist and then you want to, you know, go into communities and pat yourself on the back? No, right? So again, it's like having that conversation at work with your colleagues, with your co-workers about how you talk about your clients, about how you approach issues, about constantly 
you know, you know, Robin D'Angelo talks about white fragility um, and, and how white people, when you're when they tell them that they're racist or they've done something that's harmful or discriminatory, their first step is just to retaliate and to get defensive and to say, no, I didn't. But maybe pause, pause, right? I was listening to an adoptive mom on the weekend who said um, that a former foster youth, who I, again, I think that is care experience people in the UK, former foster youth in the US, more of them need to be engaging in social work, um, you know, said to her, when you say like my adopted daughter, and then you talk about your own children, that's interesting language that can be harmful. And she said her first stop was to be like, that's what. <laughs> to be like, you know, what are you saying? Um, I am a great, but she had to pause and be like, actually, there is something to be learned there, right? So I think that constant, you guys talk a lot about your reflective practice, that comes into your day-to-day. -day. That comes into when a family member that you're working with says something or a child you're working with, you know, raises a concern. It's taking those seriously and recognizing that you don't know everything, right? And there's always space, there's always space um, for learning and growth. Um, if you're looking for another awesome fo former foster youth, she's also a social worker to follow Jamie Matranga. Um, she is, I think, on Instagram, Family and Coffee. Um, she's a former foster youth, and she's working as a social worker in Los, in Los Angeles County in America. And she was talking about the work that former foster youth were able to do to kind of um, reform how the organization, um, their, the work that they're doing, and how they engage with children who are in care and in foster care. Um, and her story is really interesting as well about a social worker who, you know, when she was being removed from her family home, um, you know, the social worker came and said, you know, I'm going to place you in foster care. And, the, you know, she expressed to the social worker, like, that's not, you know, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to go to, you know, these are the people I trust. Right. And that social worker fought tooth and nail to make sure that, you know, getting an emergency um, order in to let that, um, you know, person at her church um, step in to actually take Jamie in instead of throwing her into the system. Right. Those are the little changes that you can be doing when a child or teenager says to you, hey, like, I don't want to do that. Or and there's reasonable, you know, there are reasonable alternatives in that situation. The alternative was she felt more comfortable going with somebody from her church that she trusted. Think about how that might be like a small inconvenience for you to go back to your manager and say, hey, like, what can we do to make this person an emergency foster parent? What steps do we need to take so that this child can go into their care? And then that child is in the care of somebody they know somebody they trust, right? And then think about the impact that then has on their emotional health, their mental health, their um, that transition into care, right? Because let's not, you know, as we know, kinship care always, I always push for kinship care. Children should be, if they cannot be with family, um, they should be, if they cannot be with, you know, their parents, there should always be family members. And we should be supporting that. We should be thinking about policies and changes that we can be doing as social workers. I'm not social worker, but, you know, as social workers, so, so that so that children don't have to leave their entire family. Because there is less trauma, There there is research on this, there is less trauma when you're going to the home of your aunt versus some stranger you don't know. And, you know, that that is important um, to do because that can then have outcomes that last generations that we might not even be aware of. Um, and again, I think it's even how we think about foster care, think about adoption um, and even some really interesting work I've seen by foster parents who want to engage birth families and families in that process for children in care. Um, there's some also, I think. Her, oops, my timer went off. I think her name is um, on Instagram, foster, foster mom Cheyenne. I, I can't remember, but she is doing some, she's a foster parent and she was just, um, her children are transitioning back to their, back to their, um, their, their, their birth mom. And she was doing things to support that process, right? So when we have children transitioning out of care. It's about the work that we can do as social workers to support that. So the social worker she was working with has let, allowed her to take 
charge on that, you know, allowing the birth mom to come in and be able to observe the day to day, you know, supporting that process of getting the kids car seats and getting them situated. Um, and, you know, you can be pushing for more involvement from your from your carers, from your foster carers and getting them more involved in that process in terms of reuniting families, because I do believe for the most part, families are better together, right? And so the work that can be done as social workers, if that social worker has said, no, this is what the court has said, you're gonna, you know, she's gonna have four visits, four visits back home, that's it, we can't change it, that's just the law, I'm not pushing it, right? But that social worker was like, okay, working with her, let's work together. Let's allow her to have extended visits. You know, she even did like a photo shoot with um, both, you know, the children and both moms. And she's like helping that the mom who is getting her kids back with parenting, you know, and that's from um, social workers willing to kind of work together, right? So I think your impact, again, is recognizing that your impact doesn't have to be huge. The things that you're doing do not have to be massive. Um, but, you know, having those conversations, taking those steps, pushing with those small changes can have um, impacts for generations to come. Um, I am done talking now. and I'm going to open up for questions. Thanks, June. Um, there's a couple of questions so far, but I'm hoping other people will perhaps post some questions. So two of the questions, I think, um, they're quite specific um, and, um, and I'd really like to know the answers as well. So M is asking, she said um, she sees lots of parallels between critical race theory and intersectional theory, but what are the differences? Yeah, that's that's so complicated. I don't know if I can give a great answer. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think the best thing I can say is that critical race theory, specifically dealing with race um, as a mode of understanding, you know, power and oppression um, and, and society and intersectionality is overlapping. So intersectionality will use race or critical race theory as one of its models of understanding power and oppression in the society, society and kind of social change and social justice. But it would also bring in other elements like gender and class. Um, and, uh, and, and, and and sexuality and disability into that conversation. So what you have is, excuse me, what you have is um, interlocking um, conversations. So, you know, when you're thinking about critical race theory, might think about Black women, but, you know, when you think about intersectionality, you might be able to bring in conversations around disability and sexuality and how that might complicate the, the conversation further. Um, there are obviously lots of um, overlap. Another kind of theory that people often talk about is misogynoir, which was coined by um, Moya Bailey, and that is specifically thinking about anti-Black racism and how that intersects with uh, gender depression. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. Thank you. Um, I think you saw the complexity much more than me, June. I was thinking, because I, it didn't say critical race theory, it just said critical theory. And I suppose this is where we could have a bit of a debate about this, because this is like my basic understanding. But I suppose critical theory is, bit, is all the theory around power. And I was thinking about um, intersectional theory being much more about seeing that where the power lies through a feminist lens that was the way i was looking at perhaps some of that difference. yeah absolutely intersectionality is a feminist approach but i always say that feminist approaches apply to everything and everybody and every theory because any kind of theory that deals with women or non gender non or gender non-binary people is a feminist theory basically feminism comes in all of that but i think really what intersectionality you know really pushes us to do is that intersectionality is really like moving or thinking about these issues through one lens isn't enough. I think that's probably the best way to explain it. So there are lots and lots of other mitigating factors that together combine and might oppress a person even further, right? So maybe a great example of this, you might be thinking about critical race theory, might be thinking about um, how Black men are, yeah, I think this will help, might think about how like Black men who are, um, like um, arrested because they quote unquote like engaging in like behavior, maybe they're selling drugs or whatever, like um, 
they're arrested and then they experience like harm from the police, right? But intersectionality might bring in disability and think about how like um, a disabled black man might be read differently, how they might be suspect to more harm because of their disability and they're like, maybe they have sensory issues or other issues, how that might be taken, right? So maybe their quote unquote behavior that isn't normal behavior that you know, that's stupid, but you know what I mean? Like quote unquote normal behavior, if they behave differently, maybe the police officer might think like they're, you know, they're, they're not okay. Like maybe they're not quote unquote mentally well, whatever, like whatever kind of um, bias comes in and then they might exert more force on that person, right? So lots of people will talk about how mm -hmm. I've seen lots of black mothers with autistic sons, black autistic sons will say like, my child has is a black man, but he also has autism, autism, and that affects how we move through the world. But a police officer or somebody else who's looking at him might not know that. And so they might perceive him to be a threat when he's not. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So intersectionality will, will, will get us to think about, okay, what are the additional kind of threats that a child or a person who might have autism, how they move through the world, right? Um, there are lots of, there's, I was listening to some really interesting um, not interesting, but really kind of sad work about how um, um, the sedation in the U.S. of people um, sedating them, like police officers sedating them, getting like emergency services involved because they quote unquote think like they have like behavior that's not normal. And so like they're sedating them and that can be harmful because when you're giving a sedative, like you don't know how much they weigh. And there was a specific instance where there was a man called Elijah was giving like a higher dose of the, than he needed because they overestimated his weight by a hundred pounds. And he almost died with that drug. Right. But you know, again, like that's what intersectionality is going to get you to do. It's not just going to think, get you to think about race, it's going to get you to think about, you know, other factors and other things so that you have a more nuanced approach to the issues that you're dealing with. Thank you. Thanks, June. I suppose it fits in a little bit with um, the way I talk about approaches, flavouring everything that you do. And it's that bit about that feminist approach, flavouring all of this is that part of intersectionality. So thank you for that. And then another question comes from Anthony, who asks, can intersectionality be the same as biopsychosocial approach, i.e. taking a holistic view on the client and the environment? Absolutely. I think that's what intersectionality is asking us to do, is to be more holistic and whole in our in the way in which we approach and think about issues and environments. So yes, like, again, it's that multi-layered approach. Intersectionality is, that, is, the, is essentially a multi-layered approach. When you go into a home and you're having a holistic intersectional approach, you're not just going to think about poverty, you might think about race and how that intersects with poverty and how that intersects with mental health and how that intersects with disability and how, how that intersects with access and care. Like there's so much that you could be doing. So making sure again that, but you know, intersectionality always, I think what it pushes you to do, I constantly think about power in that, in that room, power and oppression. Who has power? Maybe why don't they have power? What's limiting their power? What are the structures, the barriers in place that are you know, limiting the power that this family might have to create a safe home, limiting the power this family might have to pull themselves out of poverty, living in fact, you know, the power that this family might have to deal with issues around disability, right? Because we know that families who have more money, who have, will have inherently better access to treatments, they can access private treatments, they don't have to rely on the NHS, you know, but then we also know that families with children who have disabilities, you know, if they're Black, they might be dealing with racism from their providers, right? So, and then how does that then impact a parent? How might that make a parent feel, you know, scared to kind of raise their voice or advocate for their child because they're met with disdain or whatever, right? So intersectionality, again, I think is just really about humanizing people and humanizing situations and giving us, you know, giving, you know, the benefit of the doubt and really thinking about those structures. It's about structures. It's not really about identity, per se, but mm -hmm. like st structural issues, structural oppression, and how that mm -hmm. holds individuals and families in, in, in back, yeah. And I like a phrase that you've used a few times tonight, June, where you've talked about how um, people how people move through the world. I mean, that's a great phrase, you know, for us to think about how people move for, through the world. But then when you were then talking about 
you always see power in the room. I also think it's important, isn't it? And I know you will know, but that to see how power moves through the world because power is fluid and it moves. And because somebody has power in one situation and one environment, they may have no power in another situation and another environment. And I think sometimes, sometimes when students in my experience are looking at power, sometimes they don't see that movement. And I think being able to see fluidity and movement for me is a key part of intersectionality recognizing that things are fluid things are not fixed yeah. um, and, and in many ways it therefore links into complexity theory and it is a complex theory so um they, that's my thoughts I suppose absolutely and I mean I was looking at um I, I do a lot of my thinking on social media and I know um Tristan McMill Cotton who is amazing as well that's a um really interesting um, Tressie McMillan Cottom is something, you know, someone you should be following. She's a scholar. And she was talking about how, you know, she was a black woman. Um, and, she, you know, she's a bigger black woman and she finally had access to health care. Right. But when she went into the room to see the doctor, they still saw a, a black woman with no power. Right. And so she was able to walk outside. So there was, you know, she was experiencing racism and discrimination and misogynoir within that space with her provider. But because of her class, right, and the power she had, she was able to walk out of that doctor's office and go see another one. So it's, it's so complex, like what, you know, Siobhan's saying, like, she had the power in terms of access to care, and that, you know, privileged her in one way, but her provider still saw her as a Black woman and still kind of, you know, um, belittled her because of that. Um, and so it's like, so it's so complex, right? Because in one space she had power and having that class privilege allowed her to say, okay, well, I'm not dealing with you. But then like, she still has to, you can have that class privilege as a black woman. You can be a professor, you know, a doctor, you can be, she's one of MacArthur Genius Grant. You can have all of that and you can walk into a doctor's office and they will just think, you know, if they come in with their races, they're just going to see another Black woman. They're, they don't care about your class privilege and all of that, right? So again, you might have power in one realm, but then in another, like, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's where things can get really complicated. But yeah. We have two minutes. Sorry, I was just reaching over to get something there, June, <laughs> because they were the questions that we had. And I know we're, we're close on time now. And we, you know, we know people want to get off for the evening. It's been fascinating what you've shared June but you know that I've recently moved and I've been talking to you about the kinds of you know I'm um, decorating and all of that so these two sit on my window ledge and I'm just looking at them as you were talking I'm deciding where to put them at the moment but I was thinking these two summarize I think some of what we were saying tonight so you probably know Audrey Lord's quote I am not free whilst any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my yeah. own. Yeah. And that's so important, isn't it, in terms of intersectionality, that women's experiences are so different in terms of the intersection of all the things that you've talked about tonight. And I was thinking, and some of the notes that I've made for myself here are, sometimes I can feel challenged by all of this because I can feel so powerless. What can I do to change things? Because it's systemic change. And what can I do as an individual? But then the other one that I was looking at um, is this, I love it, from Amanda Gorman. So, yeah. for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. And both of those, I think, are just from very powerful women really important quotes that also link in I think to it's International Women's Day on Tuesday as you will know and this year the theme is break the bias and I'm hoping that people who've listened to you tonight are taking something about that feminist approach and that intersectionality and thinking about how we can bring that into our everyday practice as social workers. So thank you so much for joining us again, June. Um, it's been amazing. The final question is quite a few people have said they've met, I mean, people want to watch this back because you always throw so many things in at us, which is fabulous. But quite a few people have said they've missed um, some of the um, links that you've suggested. And I was wondering whether maybe you might be able to email us a bit of a list. Yes, that I we can, can send out. email you a list of 
accounts and people you should be following. And I definitely always say as social workers, I need more of you to be following birth, birth families, especially if you're dealing with adoption, um, families who are parents who are foster care. So you can actually have an insight into the day to day, because I think that is so important in your practice. Um, is understanding what it's like for the people on the other side, right? So make sure that if, if you know you can't, maybe you not can't necessarily follow your client, you know, on Instagram. That would definitely be wrong. I know it's social work standards, but there are families who are online sharing what it's like to live with different disabilities, sharing what it's like to be engaging in the foster care system. There are um, people who are care experienced who are on Twitter and social media. Follow those accounts. That's where you're going to get your lived experience from those people who know what it's like to move into the system from the other end. For the social workers, a lot of us might not have that lived experience. So we don't really know what it's like to be living with those issues. So making sure, you know, Dave, I think, yeah. Is that your name? Yeah. Oh my God, if it's just why his name is so embarrassing. Anyway, he's, you know, he's care experienced. So definitely go follow him on Twitter and have that insight because I think that insight is so, so, so important to how you, um, you think about your practice. Like even if you cannot follow your clients, there are so many accounts, um, everyday racism, um, lots of accounts, just, just, you know, do your Google again, do the work. That's what I always tell people. Do not expect people like me, people who have those lived experience to do the work for you. Google is free. It is free <laughs> and you can go, I mean, it's not free. And we can talk about internet access and all of that and a whole other uh, conversation. But for the most part, most that's another country, night, dude. That's another <laughs> night, but we have access to smartphones. So do the work, yeah. do the Google. You don't always have to be reading these hefty academic texts. Sometimes just following a couple of Instagram accounts will give you more insight than some of these, because a lot of these people writing your textbooks, they have no idea what they're talking about either. They do not have the experience, you know, the lived experience. Some do though, do. Some Think do. about Some Outlanders. Do. Outlanders is written narratives of social workers of colour and there is such a lot of powerful information about intersectionality and outlanders yes. so there are some texts and we that need, I think, yes there are some texts you know, and we need more practitioners yeah. and more social workers and lived experience but you know Absolutely. don't lose the sight that you know following those accounts hearing directly from those voices you know you don't always have to be you know reading books sometimes just seeing the day-to-day -day can really inform how you think about things and how you think about your practice Thank you. And June, that takes us on really smoothly to our next week's webinar, which is Voice of Lived Experience. So Sarah Jane is going to be coming to talk to us between the lines and asking the whys, thinking about trauma, bringing a lived experience perspective. Now, that is going to be a not videoed session. You will only be able to see that live. It will not go onto YouTube. Quite often, our lived experience sessions don't go onto YouTube. They tend to be a more intimate night where people share their experiences. There's an awful lot for you to get from Sarah Jane next week. I met with her yesterday for us to uh, run through it, and it's brilliant. There's such a lot of learning for you. So please do join us next week. Uh, remember, it's only available live, our next session. And then we're on to our World Social Work Day session where we'll be looking at how social work is leaving people behind. And it will follow up a lot of what June said tonight. And then we're back to uh, back to basics, values and ethics. The team are putting the links into the chat, I'm sure, David. So June, did you want that final word if I, I hand over to you? One final thing, just because I think it's very omnipresent and on my mind, thinking about Ukraine. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, just to bring that up. Some of the work, you know, we've been seeing, I have uh, seen some interesting reporting about, you know, Black students and Black people not being able to cross the border into Poland. You know, people saying it's Ukrainians first. Tonight, I was reading some interesting reporting from Vice Media about trans and non-binary people who are scared to, you know, even try and cross the border because their documentation, they might be presenting as female, but their documentation still has, you know, their gender identity as male. And so there's fear that they could be forcibly conscripted. So even in war, Right? Even in situations of war and conflict, we can be thinking about intersectional approaches again because that's very front of mind in what we're seeing. So just make sure that when you're thinking about Ukraine and the crisis, make sure that, again, how you're approaching that, start doing some research, start reading about um, 
the racism people are feeling around issues around gender, um, you know, um, there's some work around sexuality, um, people who are more disabled, think about how hard it might be for people who don't have cars to drive to the border, who don't have, who have just, you know, maybe wheelchair, you know, in wheelchairs or whatever kind of disability sight impaired and how that might impact their experiences of war. So intersectionality is always, always, always going to be a useful theory. So I just wanted to end with that. Thank you, Joan. Thanks so much. And I think what you've demonstrated for us tonight is Sage's win is our uh, social work's loss. But thank you ever so much for joining us again. And good luck with the new job on Monday. Good night, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.